So, Professor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Juan. Uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here, uh, back in Infa in Brazil. Um, uh, it's been a while, so uh, I hope to come back here uh, more regularly. Um, uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a real privilege and a pleasure to be here. I'd like to talk about some work that uh, my friend and colleague Dan Marchison has I have been doing together for many years. Um, it concerns the theory of waves in three-phase flow. Uh, this served as an impetus for developing some of the tools that uh, Dan and his students and his colleagues have been uh, extending and utilizing uh, over the years. Um, this uh, problem has a challenge, and that turns out to be the coincidence of wave speeds, or so-called resonance. Uh, and the result was that there are some waves in the flow and porous medium that are not of the classical type. Uh, they are, in fact, analogous or of the same type as flame fronts. So um, we'll see a connection with uh, various talks that have uh, taken place. Um, I want to uh, illustrate this uh, these methods and the uh, tools by using um, uh, so solving a Riemann problem based on uh, the issue of, of in injecting water and gas alternately uh, into a porous medium to optimize recovery. So let me start very right at the beginning, I, uh, there are so many experts in the audience, they'll be bored. Um, but uh, for reference, let's talk about two-phase flow. So I'm looking at one-dimensional flow uh, through a plug of rock. There's water and oil in here initially, and we're injecting water and hoping to get oil out the other side. So this is an immiscible situation. Um, the conservation of uh, water uh, tells how the, the mass of water, the saturation of water changes with time. Uh, it's governed by a flux, and this flux is related to the properties of the uh, the rock together with uh, the, the various fluids. So there's a KW uh, uh, permeability associated with water and one with oil. And you form a flux function by taking a ratio of this form. Uh, the simplest qualitative uh, form for the for the permeabilities is simply a quadratic. So we'll, we'll look at just that problem. And then there's the famous Buckley-Leverett solution, uh, which consists of a oil bank driving the oil ahead of it, followed by the water, which is gradually uh, decreasing from pure water to a certain saturation. Uh, this is a expanding wave. This whole picture just expands in time. Uh, and the solution comes about by looking at a picture of the flux function plotted against uh, this water saturation. You uh, follow uh, the curve out to a certain point where you're tangent and then jump. So this point SA is this point over here. Um, 
this envelope construction was uh, uh, given in, in the general case of, of, of uh, uh, more complicated flux functions uh, by Olenek. So in this context of one conservation law, a scalar conservation law, uh, there are two elements to the solution. Uh, one are, oops, um, one are the continuous solutions that are constant along characteristic curves that are determined by this differential equation. So the derivative of f gives you the speed of propagation. Uh, there are also discontinuous solutions, and they propagate on a, an analogous differential equation, um, except it's a form of a finite difference quotient. And the characteristic property of these ways is that uh, characteristics that expand form a rarefaction wave. So here we have a plot of time versus x, and we have the characteristics that are expanding. That's this wave on the left side here. And then there's the possibility that characteristics can converge, as they do here, to form a shock wave. And then that shock wave propagates at its speed. That depends on the relationship between the states on the two sides of the shock. And in this case, you can see that the interacting shock and rarefaction waves decay. The, the, the rarefaction wave chasing the shock causes the shock wave to decay. So in the three-phase case, we're going to uh, again look at a porous, uh, cylindrical porous rock sample. And the idea is to have um, mostly oil, but partly uh, water and gas in the rock initially. And then we're going to inject water and gas, and we alternate the injection. Um, we have assumptions about immiscibility and compressibility of the gas and simplifications about quadratic permeabilities like we we've uh, done in the uh, uh, two-phase case, and I'll talk also about capillary pressures, which are important. So again, we have uh, a, a cylindrical rock sample, and now we have three phases. So that can be represented in, in the saturation triangle that we've seen. Uh, we start with some uh, bright state, some initial saturation in this, this rock sample. And we uh, first in, uh, uh, inject the gas, then we inject water, then we inject gas and water and alternate in such a way that on average, the uh, injection state would be uh, this SL. Uh, what we're going to find is that uh, a simulation of this full process of alternating will start to resemble closely a solution of a Riemann problem from this left state to this uh, right state. So here's the picture. Uh, the, uh, uh, we have what looks quite like a Buckley-Leverett wave. Uh, there's a big uh, rarefaction wave. That actually follows a path in, in the saturation triangle that leads uh, more or less in a straight fashion from SL to SA. And superimposed on this in the uh, horizontal variation direction are uh, waves of water and gas. So we'll find these are fast waves propagating on a slow rarefaction wave. So 
So we get this a rarefaction wave like in, uh, as in Buckley-Leverett. Then uh, we have this feature that's different from Buckley-Leverett. We have two waves here, uh, one leading from SA to a middle state, SB, and another leading from SB to SR. So this is a new feature. This, Normally, in two conservation laws, you would have two waves, a fast wave and a slow wave. Now we have a third type of wave, a transitional or undercompressive wave. And uh, the thing about this wave is that the states ahead and behind are sensitive to the uh, the diffusion terms, the uh, capillary pressure will induce diffusion in our, in our uh, equations, and the, these waves are sensitive to uh, the exact form there. So we'll talk about that. Um, so we have conservation of uh, water and gas, and oil goes along for the ride. And we have flux functions of, of a similar form to what we've seen involving the permeabilities, which we're taking to be simple. And we have more or less realistic values for the uh, viscosities, these uh, mu's. So um, that form is familiar. Oh, but. Um, a new thing that we have to include are these leverett diffusion terms. And they f take this form. So here are these uh, diffusion terms written as a vector, and they are a divergence, or a gradient in this case, of a matrix times this saturation gradient vector. So if you thought of this as being constant, you would have a second derivative with respect to the space here. The uh, matrix B has a, a very specific form of, of a symmetric matrix involving the mobilities, the ratios of the permeabilities to the viscosities, uh, times the Jacobian matrix of the water and uh, oil and gas and oil pressure differences. So uh, inside the uh, rock, you have water and oil, for instance. They will form a meniscus. There will be a pressure difference uh, between the two fluids. And similarly, between gas and oil, there will be a pressure difference. And these. Uh, uh, as we've seen, uh, uh, depend on the saturations. So we take a, uh, a Jacobian and multiply by a certain matrix, and you get a, uh, a diffusion operator. So to do the analysis, you uh, first of all look at rarefaction waves by looking at the Jacobian derivative of the flux. There will be two eigenvalues. Slow is blue, and fast is red. And the curves along which the state varies across the rarefaction uh, are orbits of eigenvectors in this plane. And you parameterize the, these curves using uh, the uh, x over t being equal to the characteristic speed to get a rarefaction wave. So they look like this. Um, if we look along an edge, let's say the oil-water edge, then we have the same situation as in the Buckley-Leverett two-phase flow case. So uh, along the edge is exactly Buckley-Leverett. Nearby the edge, we get uh, rarefaction waves of the fast family that are similar uh, I mean, almost parallel to this, uh, this edge. But you have the same situation on the other two sides. 
So you can see uh, visually and you can prove uh, mathematically that th you have to have a singularity in these rarefaction fields and in fact in other aspects of the, uh, of the Riemann uh, problem uh, somewhere in the center. Uh, in this case, there is a place marked here as SU, the umbilic point at which the characteristic speeds coincide. And this gives you a, a threefold formation for the rarefaction waves, whereas uh, every place else, they form a nice uh, parallel set of waves. And if you look at the other family, they're transverse everywhere except at the, uh, the umbilic point. So it forms a nice coordinate system with which you can construct uh, solutions. Now, these pictures are coming from a Riemann problem package that uh, Eli Isaacson, my, uh, Dan, and myself have worked on, uh, along with a myriad of Dan's students. Um, this uh, umbilic point doesn't have to be a point, it could be a whole region. And uh, inside that region is a, a, a region in which, or outside of it actually, uh, outside this yellow region it surrounds um, a, a small region in uh, purple here, inside of which the eigenvalues are complex. Uh, this yellow curve is a region of instability. Uh, the instability is in the sense of looking at uh, small perturbations of the full equations, including the diffusion terms. So this um, Mida Pago boundary depends on B, that, uh, that diffusion matrix. And uh, so here is an example. So this is not with. Um, well, let's see, is it? Yeah, I guess it's also with um, quadratic permeabilities, but a different value for, for B. So, um, so we have to avoid this situation, otherwise we get linearized instability of the, of the, of the solution, even with a, a diffusion equation. Um, the other element of the solution of the Riemann problem are shock waves. We've seen uh, the uh, ranking hugonio conditions before. Uh, that sets a relationship between the end states of the shock wave. And what I've not written down here, but should be included, are the diffusion terms integrated once. And that gives you a differential equation that allows you to fill in the gap between the two end states. So here are the uh, solutions of the rankin eugonio conditions. Um, here is a more or less generic picture um, which undergoes bifurcations when you go on to certain uh, lines here, certain diagonals. The color coding is for different types of shock not every shock is physically stable. Uh, the blue uh, corresponds to the sh shocks of the slow family and the red for the shocks of the fast family. Uh, the green are going to be important and most of these other sh shock waves only form boundaries in the uh, uh, solution of the Riemann, picture, uh, Riemann problem picture. So here are the ODEs, uh, including this, uh, the effects of capillary pressure. Um, so it turns out that the solution of the rankin eugonio conditions, which makes these two zero, form equilibria for the differential equation. And a shock profile is an orbit joining uh, the two equilibria leading from left to right. Uh, 
So here is a picture of a, uh, uh, an orbit leading from left to right for an example here being a slow shock wave. You can see that this is a repeller and this is a saddle point. If I perturb this picture, this orbit is preserved. Uh, if I perturb, for instance, the uh, left state and keep the right state, I still get a, a, a shock wave. Now the, the uh, actual orbit changes, but if you're picturing the shock wave as being very thin, then the actual orbit doesn't matter much. Similarly, we have uh, the fast family. Here's an example of a, an orbit for a fast family, a shock wave. Uh, if you have nearby states, so here we have a picture of the triangle, but the triangle is much bigger than, than this picture. We're zooming in for states SL and SR that are, are relatively close together. Then the solution of the Riemann problem can involve uh, rarefaction or shock waves of the first family followed by a rarefaction or shock wave of the second family. So here I show an example with a rarefaction wave. You can see it spreading out here in the first characteristic family. Then there's uh, a shock wave here. Uh, you can see the convergence of the characteristics here. So that's the local picture. But on a global uh, level, uh, you find that sometimes you need other waves. So here is a picture of, of this uh, transitional or non-classical shock wave. Uh, the rankin hugonio conditions have a solution on this green branch. What that means is that you, you have a saddle point and a saddle point. Now, if, if, if you're familiar with differential equations, if you perturb a, a saddle, saddle connection, it generically will break. So uh, it has a different stability nature than do the shock waves, uh, the fast and slow shock waves. Uh, the orbit breaks under most perturbations. You can think of the existence of this uh, wave as uh, giving you an extra condition and that turns out to be just the right number of conditions in order to construct the Riemann problem. If you have this uh, transitional or saddle to saddle connection in the middle of a solution of a, a Riemann problem and you perturb the states, despite the instability of the individual waves, the whole picture is stable. Uh, However, the orbit depends strongly on the diffusion and on, on perturbations. So in particular, the left and right states that uh, occur are very sensitive to this. So um, I, I want to come back to the usage of this, this uh, non-classical wave. But first, I want to show you another picture from the Riemann problem package that with a solution of a, a classical Riemann problem on a global level. So here we've got a, a shock wave, an SL here and an SR over on the, the sort of a little bit to the right up in this corner. Uh, the solution involves a rarefaction wave followed by a, sh a, fir a first family shock. So you have this expansion and a shock wave followed by a shock wave of the fast family. So here are the converging characteristics again. So now what I'm going to do is perturb this. I'm going to move this SR over just a little bit and we're going to get a, 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 a different uh, construction involved in solving the Riemann problem. 
So there I moved SR, and now instead of having a rarefaction leading from some place over, I'm sorry, a shock wave leading from some place over here to SR, now we have to go to SR using one of these non-classical waves. So here is the orbit, and then there's a small shock wave. So you see now that instead of having uh, a single plateau up here, there are two plateaus. Uh, the SB is, uh, SA to SB is this non-classical wave, and you can see it's really the largest well, it's comparable to this rarefaction wave, but it's the larger of the two waves leading the front. So in some sense, it's responsible for most of the oil production. And I want to emphasize that this, uh, these two states, the choice of SA, where you come from the one state, from the uh, end of the one rarefaction, to SB, where you end up on the Hugonio with a saddle-to-saddle -saddle connection, that that is sensitively dependent on the uh, diffusion terms. Now, whether or not that sensitive dependence is important in applications in oil reservoirs uh, has been, uh, it, it's, that's an open question, as Jim Glim has emphasized. There are lots of other effects in play here, for instance, the heterogeneity of the, the rock. But uh, in general, if you used a, um, a, a uh, finite difference type scheme to solve this, uh, its finite difference on, uh, it, its own numerical viscosity could dominate the, uh, the physical viscosity and lead to getting incorrect states here, SA and SB. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, but uh, so this wave is a prime candidate for tracking uh, the wave. You, you can solve this Riemann problem, a local Riemann problem from nearby here to nearby here and uh, find how this moves. And I should say again that th this uh, type of wave is similar in spirit to the, uh, uh, the uh, flame fronts that we've been looking at. Now, you might think that um, these waves are important uh, only in a certain small region, maybe a small region near the umbilic point. So what I've drawn here are all the right states that would involve a non-classical wave. So anything in this red patch here uh, involves a non-classical wave followed, following the rarefaction or leading the rarefaction, actually, uh, to a point here followed by some kind of two wave. So back to alternating uh, injection of water and gas. Um, what is happening, what, what we've done is just recognize that the Riemann solution provides uh, a, a three quarters here of what's going on in this uh, uh, time dependent problem. Uh, the, the, the basic structure of the solution consists of these waves that come out of the Riemann problem, which could include a transitional wave, but then uh, superimposed on the uh, slow rarefaction is a fast decaying oscillatory wave. So again, the picture is this. Um, we have, you can squint and see that if you flatten this, you would have the Riemann solution uh, that, that we're getting. Uh, and so this is a, an, a full simulation with a 
high resolution uh, using a finite difference scheme of this dynamic problem. And uh, you, you can see that uh, if we had solved a Riemann problem, we would get some structure that's similar. So uh, the point is that these uh, transitional waves can sometimes be responsible for most of the oil recovery, so uh, it's important to get them right. Uh, you could also use WAG to tune which uh, transitional wave you get to maximize the recovery. And you can, even though this is a dynamic problem, you can do that very quickly using this Riemann solver software. So, and again, then the warning is that under-resolved simulations uh, can misrepresent the transitional waves and you have to be careful. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for a nice talk.